offer to one of you, to one of today's graduates, thanks so much for your investment and a special welcome to Doan. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's commencement speaker, Reverend Dr. Robert Polk. Dr. Polk's bio is in the program. I will share just a couple highlights. Throughout his life, Dr. Polk has been a trailblazer, the first in many areas. In 1952, he became Doan's first black graduate, a historic milestone reflecting our past and ongoing commitment to making Doan a welcoming home for all. His legacy is cemented through the Robert L. Polk Lectureship Series on Race and Social Justice, and it continues to inspire future generations. Doan College, now Doan University, is one of the many institutions Dr. Polk transformed. When faced with the initial denial of his admissions due to racial prejudice, his vision for an inclusive Doan prevailed. He was told by a dean on Doan's campus, no white person would room with you so you can't come. Then, the late Dr. Donald Goodrich answered the call and said, I will room with him. Alongside, excuse me, Dr. Polk, alongside his roommate, taught an unforgettable lesson in justice and equity, changing the trajectory of our university forever. Today, excuse me, yesterday, we memorialized Dr. Polk's legacy and his courageous efforts to build bridges and transform lives through his ministry by naming our new open air amphitheater behind the new residence hall, Brody Hall, we named it the Robert L. Polk Open Air Theater. What's more, Dr. Polk turned 96 years young last week, and he shows no evidence of slowing down. Trust me, two Red Bulls and three cups of coffee, and I'm dragging. <laughs> it is my great honor to welcome back fellow Don't Tiger, Reverend Dr. Robert Polk. Good afternoon, Dr. Hughes, President Hughes, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty and staff and the to total Doan family, members of the Polk Lecture Committee, visitors and special guests, and my special guest, Dr. and Mrs. Taylor from Florida, my extended family from Cathedral Village in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I know many are watching today and keeping their eyes on me members of the graduating class of 2024, I salute you. I'm sorry I missed the choral concert last night, but I've always wanted to have the opportunity to speak to that wonderful choral group you have here to tell you that the signature piece that you sing at the end of each concert, Precious Lord Take My Hand, was written by one of my neighbors in Chicago, Thomas A. Dorsey. And I, grad I congratulate you on the way you sing that wonderful piece and say that no other course that I've ever heard in my 96 years has sung it as well. Not the Mormons, not church choirs, not anybody. So I congratulate you. These words from a great preacher of the last century, Dr. Harry Emerson Fosdick, from a hymn. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the facing of this hour and for the living of these days. My message today is on courage, acts of courage, being courageous. I must say that my being here is a personal act of courage at the age of 96. Mr. President, it's been a roller coaster ride for me since receiving your invitation, not only to have the new theater bear my name or to see once again the beauty of this magnificent campus, but to be the speaker at both baccalaureate and commencement. In my community, we would call that a double whammy. <laughs> The great Dr. Paul Tillich of the last century, theologian, philosopher, speaker, was asked by one of his former students how he was in retirement. And Dr. Tillich responded, my memory is waning, but my remembrances grow richer every day. My memory is waning, 
but my remembrances grow richer every day. This is my takeoff point when it comes to my life and most recently and especially when it comes to Doan University and my long and deep sense of involvement. My thoughts and remembrances of the alma mater have taken me to joy to deep places and I have received here great rewards from my years at Doan College. I was where you were 72 years ago, graduates, 72 years ago. It's been a great time to think back, to support, to be a part of the Doan College family as it has grown and grown and developed and developed and changed its model to leaders and developing leadership. I could not be more happy in returning now to notice the great advancements and achievements that the college has achieved, but also that you as the new graduating class of 2024 have achieved and will go on and achieve more. I must confess that I'm not one who relishes uh, the spotlight or being out front or ever being thought of as a celebrity. I sure ain't a rock star at 96. There were no rocks when I was growing up. <laughs> but you know, I thought to myself, you know, I can kind of uh, hide my humility for a little bit and uh, accept the wonderful kudos that Doan has given me in the last several days since I've been here. And I feel like a rock star. I feel like a celebrity because the hospitality and the joy of being back to the <laughs> alma mater, my foster mother, has really been extraordinary and I've relished every bit of it. The little humor that we have to have periodically that's also humor that tells deep stories, even though it may sound shallow on the top. So in talking about myself and my experiences at Doan College, I thought I'd start off with a few things that I remember well when I arrived in 1949, when your grandparents weren't even born. After the first um, four or five weeks, I looked in the mirror, I said, my gosh, I need a haircut. Where would I get a haircut in Crete, Nebraska? There ain't no barber shops in Crete, Nebraska going to cut a black man's hair. And so the word got around, and uh, a student caught me in the library one day. He said, I hear you're looking for a barber to cut your hair. I said, yes. He said, well, my brother was in the military in the, in the war, and when Harry Truman integrated the troops, he was able to learn to cut black hair as well as white hair. He said, he's downtown. I recommend that you go to see him. He will be delighted to be your barber while you're here at Doan. And so I went down, and he was my barber for the next several years. I say this because, you know, sometimes people don't understand what you go through when you are the first, when you're not, everybody's not used to you. And uh, these are the ideas that I would share with you. The second one in terms of being the first and not being understood very well by faculty or students, it was when um, we would go to eat in the dining room at the bottom of Freeze Hall. I worked for Mrs. Ott, who was the uh, director of dining, dining room services. The little lady was uh, very uh, strong in her opinions on things, and uh, she knew how to run the dining room in a first class way. And so every Sunday night, maybe three Sunday nights out of four, she would serve chili, and chili is my favorite dish. And so, you know, we'd only, we were only allowed one dish of chili. Go through the line and get your chili and the, and the fixings that go with it, and then you sit down. And so some of the guys were pretty hungry by that time of night on Sunday afternoon, and they would slip back into the line, and she wouldn't know who they were because her vision was failing too. And then I thought, well, I'm going to try it too. <laughs> so you got it. So I slipped through the line, and Mrs. Ott, who couldn't see, she said, I see you, Bob Polk. You've had your bowl of chili. Get out of the line. <laughs> so that's the way it goes. Then my final little thought there has to do with my best friend at Doan was Walt Olson, late, the late Walter Olson, Reverend Walter Olson, and his wife, um, and they were being married just the afternoon after commencement. And uh, Ruth's father, the bride's father, had a little reception, his father and mother, her father and mother had a little reception in the uh, 
dining hall porch, members of the wedding party. I had the pleasure of being Walt's best man. And uh, the father, Mr. Ross, would go around and talk to each person about each person. When he got to me, he said, Bob Polk, he said, you are the Jackie Robinson of Doan College. <laughs> I said, well, isn't that nice? <laughs> and so uh, that, thank you. So that was indeed a privilege to have him say that. But you know, few people, many people know about my applying to Doan College originally and being turned down by the Dean of Students because no white student wanted to live with me. And then we went to the agencies of church officials and they sent a second letter three or four weeks later and we were ad admitted. But few people know about my earlier time at Doan three years before I attempted to enroll, <coughs> along with my church youth group classmate, Georgette Weaver. We both were denied admission with the excuse that there would be no white students willing to room with black students. And so I had an opportunity to know about this place before I ever applied. In 1946, I was a senior in high school and my minister and his wife wanted me to attend a national church youth conference at a place called Doan College in a place called Crete, Nebraska. Well, I'm from Chicago South Side and I had no idea where Doan College was, where Crete, Nebraska was. And so it was the day after our prom and I went out with my two best friends and our dates and we were all spiffed up with bow ties, thank you very much, hand tied. And uh, after the prom, we went to our um, favorite restaurant and we felt that we were old enough to order our adult drinks and the drinks in those days were Tom Collins and rum and coke. And we had a big dinner and had a great time, but I had to leave early. And that was one of the things that annoyed me, take my date home and get back home and help my sister wash and iron my clothes to go to Doan College in Crete, Nebraska. I had two chips on my shoulder, two chips on my shoulder. One was from being living in Chicago, which was one of the most racist cities of its size in the United States, in the northern part of the United States. Chicago was a very racist city. The issues like racial injustice could be seen and felt daily among the black population there. And uh, I had ingrained negative activities, attitudes rather, toward white people. And so I didn't really want to go to this conference because it would be an all-white conference in the all-white basis in the Congregational Church. And of course, the second chip on my shoulder was the fact that I had to leave early and take my date home early and she wasn't happy and that was probably more important than the first chip. I had never traveled alone before, nor had I even seen a small college campus before. This was a new experience for me. However, however, the entire experience on campus was so beautiful, the location was so beautiful, the programs and all the things that took place were so beautiful, I couldn't believe how much I had been missing. We had courses on uh, social action, on personal action, and finding God, and political responsibility. And there were worship gatherings and great singings outside of, uh, outside of Freeze Hall, a cappella, glorious songs that overflowed this campus. We had dancing and socialization, all the things that you and many of you have experienced going to your denomination's national or even state conference. And that was a big thing back in the 40s and the 50s. At the end, I was elected secretary of the National Pilgrim Fellowship Group. I knew absolutely nothing about what a secretary was supposed to do. There I was, you know, foiled again. But the assistant secretary, a young lady, she was smart and she knew what to do and she pulled me through. I had never been exposed to such an occasion like this. There, were such a feel, there was such a feeling of acceptance and a feeling of fellowship and a feeling of oneness among the people. And all the attitudes that I had had to melt down because they were 
unjust, it was unjust of me to think that way. And the upshot of it was that at the age of 18, my life direction became a big change that I had to concern, could concern myself with. A profound Christian experience took place, and I encountered here all of this here at Doan College. So you, Doan University, are in the main way responsible for me and what I've done in 70 plus years since I was sitting where you graduates are since and the rest of my life. We had um, three Native American girls from a reservation in North Dakota. We had several Hawaiian young ladies at this conference who had beautiful lays on, and they were beautiful too. We had Japanese Americans who had been in, in uh, relocation camps to parts of our country. We had all kinds of people in small numbers, you know, like a uh, few black people, of course, uh, like myself. And they all had stories to tell. And if they were not on the program, then we would cluster together, and I was able to listen to their stories. There was one group that I was not quite sure about. They were called COs. And for my community, we didn't know what a CO was. Three, three seminary students and one minister had just been released from prison. And I was just astounded to know that seminarians and preachers would be in prison, only to discover they were conscientious objectors from the last war, the Second World War. And they had been in prison because they dared to take a stand. They dared to be courageous enough to say they refused to go into a war and fight. And so, Doan University, you are responsible for me. I had the assumption that when I went back home to tell my friends and my family, you know, all white folks aren't bad. I had a great time. And I assumed that going to college at a small campus was going to be just like that conference. That was the wrong assumption. I thought that this was going to be a, no, a new way for me to change and develop my life. And up until the time the letter of, reje of rejection came through, I had a very positive feeling about small colleges, church-related colleges, and especially Doan College. It took high officials from our denomination to help the administration here to rescind that letter that denied my friend and I admittance to Doan College. And the rejection was very difficult. They finally found two students who agreed to a room with us, the, the, doctor, the late Dr. Donald Goodrich of Fairmont and uh, Mary Ann Stevens from Grand Island. And we all worked out, it all worked out very well. The positive response, response to be uh, roommates, it took steps of courage steps of courage in that day and at a time at Doan College. Let's have you think about another angle of that story. Don and Mary Ann were courageous. They did do what was right in my position, from my point of view. But I've never heard anybody talk about the courage that Georgetta and I had to leave our families to leave our community, to leave our comfort zone of black people where we lived on the south side of Chicago, to leave our church, to leave our youth group, to come to Doan College in Creek, Nebraska. So that's the second side of the story. The story, as you know it now, got better. A remnant of that national church group went to work and made it possible for us to come and everything began to change. And our presence, Georgetta's presence and my presence, helped to change the atmosphere and the thinking of our fellow students at Doan College. Over my many years, I've discovered that the very heart of life is relationships that you build. They are what makes you part of a team, and your teammates are your treasured bench players. They are your circle of influence. As I mentioned at the start, our memories are, in, are influ influential in how we go about living each day and each hour. 
As I look back over my long uh, life and experiences, there have been quite a number of terrible events in the world and in this country. As was the case when I was growing up in my life, there have been physical, emotional, mental trials, divisiveness, divisiveness racism throughout that long, these long years. So let's be honest. You too are in the same kind of era where anger and hatred and disbelief and disapproval exist. However, here I am at the age of 96, and I can look back and actually see the astonishing brightness of some things. The sorrows I remember are pitted against the exhilarating convictions of ordinary folks who were heroes living with the belief that they, each in their own way, could make a difference. They were committed to acts of courage. And they, that torch has been passed to you, Dillon graduates, class of 2024. You are filled with the capacity for acts of courage and the ability to change things and make them better. You can have the joy of knowing that you have made the life of every one other person better, improved the communities where you live, modeled an affirming respect for all others in the human family. In other words, you can shape history with every kind of gesture and welcoming endeavor that you can, can, you, you can pull together. Do you know that there are 12,000 colleges and universities in America? 12,000 graduations this month, chances are, and that number means how many students your age, with your abilities, with your training, are going out into the world. They have the opportunity to have acts of courage to improve the condi conditions of life in which they live. You can live with the acts of courage. My message on this occasion could have taken, it, taken me in a very different level. I'd like to um, cite two examples of people who have had acts, who have devoted themselves to acts of courage. And these two issues are with Doan students. First of all, we've mentioned Don Goodrich and Mary Ann Stevens. But the second group of Doan students, which never had much press the, the four years that they did this, four to six years, the psychology professor, Marcy Freer, uh, wanted to the Doan students to do service projects. Many Doan students at the winter break term would go to Florida, would go skiing in the mountains, would go overseas. And so she thought there should be some way we could harness some of that energy and experience and put young people to work in service projects. And so she courageously put a sign up, and we had a number of students, 12 the first year, I think, to engage in that project. What was the project? The project was that she would bring 12 to 15 students to the city of New York. She would work in the East Harlem Protestant Parish, the most underserved part of the city of New York. They would live with families and individuals in that parish. Every morning they would go to work from nine in the morning till four in the afternoon. And they would do things like you know, babysit, work in the libraries, work in soup kitchens, work in helping teachers be, uh, have a second person of teaching in their classes. And they did this. And after, after four o'clock, they were on their own to enjoy the places and the pleasures of the Big Apple. And they did this during the winter break. And the, there were two parts to this thing. They did the work in the morning, in the afternoon, they went out and enjoyed themselves. But Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday was in that same block of time. And so they would give me one day of their work and come to my home and they would share with me <clears throat> what they were doing, what they had learned, what they experienced. And in exchange for that, <clears throat> they would ask me to talk about the civil rights movement, <clears throat> excuse me, and Martin Luther King Jr. It's a wonderful opportunity. On one occasion when they were there, <clears throat> one year, 
I learned that Bishop Desmond Tutu from South Africa was coming to America, and he would be staying with friends in New York City. And I was able to get a hold of him to have him to preach his first sermon in, the, in a Harlem church on that particular Sunday afternoon. Inter, interfaith service with Jewish and Christians, and everybody came together in a black church that seated about 800 people. And on the front row, there were the 12 known students and their two advisors, Dr. Frieza Freer and her associates. And at the end of that service, and Dr. and Bishop Tutu really re uh, 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 I mean, put the place on fire, they had a chance to shake hands with him. They were, the, they were the minority in that church that afternoon. They will never forget that. So there were times when anybody, whoever you are and what the path of life you take, where you may be, you can engage in acts of courage acts of courage. I have marched, I've been in sit-ins and demonstrations, and prior to and during the civil rights movement, my best work in race and social justice has been in one-on-one -on -one or small group situations when it comes to race and social justice. What has been most rewarding for me is the power of personal and interpersonal relationships. All too often, we work with stereotypes rather than reality, and that's what happened to me when I first came to Doan College. But being face to face with others who were different from myself changed my perspective considerably and forever. That's why any viable campus must have inclusive as possible, must be as inclusive as possible. We are all part of one human family and we all deserve equity when we study together. We learn that each of us has a story to tell. Diverse conversations we have enable the possibility of broadening our horizons and building a cohesive sense of community and society. This is true in the workplace where you will be going, and this is true wherever we live in this country we call America. The better we do at including others within our sphere of positive con consideration, the better all of us will be. At the top of my list are those who will work diligently for the well-being of others, especially those who endure discrimination and bias, and racial prejudice, comments. Doan University has taught you the value of being in inquisitive in saying, I don't know, let me find out. That attitude makes it possible to look at the things anew, keep asking questions, especially when a conclusion is elusive, that is being courageous. It takes courage to know how, it takes courage to know that the true intention of goodness involves sharing each other's burdens, that you may not always be as, as easy as you would like it to be, but things usually work out, and as Spike Lee would say in his movie, you know, things do, get, things do get better. At the core of it all is a sense of humility. That entails honoring the gifts of others and being willing to work on a cooperative basis. I believe the best things are done individually. They are the results of combined efforts toward common good, a common good. Each of us is, is unique in our, in our shared humanity, but each of us is like a unique part of a marvelous quilt. Each piece is different. Each shape is different. Each size is different. Each color is different, but we have the pattern, and that means we are irreplaceable. For me, that suggests each of us has a, something special to give to the world that you will be going out into. Walt Whitman wrote about going out into an unknown region with no map or guide. I dispute that. You have a map that was provided to you here at Doan University. It consists of an education that has embedded in you a deep sense of curiosity 
and generosity and leadership and you will be able to take your your degree and your learning out into the world and make it a better place through your moral compass. I have spent my entire life in building bridges and for, of understanding among and breaking down the walls that separate us. I ask you, Stone students, to embrace that same community by picking up the torch I and others have been carrying and send that flame hold onward and take that flame hold onward. Stone has made you strong and alert. You also will have to be filled with courage for the road that lies ahead. I know you will know the aliveness when you see it as you know and how, how to commit yourselves to that road that is ahead of you so that you can be among those when the saying goes, well done, good and faithful servant. And always, always remember, please remember that our creator has made all of us courageous souls out of stardust. My congratulations, best wishes, and God's blessings on all of you, especially the class of 2024. May you do well. <laughs>